Welcome to the Alaska Weather Show. I'm meteorologist Peter Chan coming to you from the National Weather Service on this Saturday, December 10th. We have a lot to talk about with not a whole lot of time for this public uh, weather segment. If you want additional weather information, go to weather.gov. It's a point and click interactive map right now looking at the continental US. We have a variety of winter storm warnings, winter weather advisories, very uh, wintry pattern there over the uh, at least west, northwest interior uh, and a winter storm watch covering much of the northern plains as a system will be emerging from the Rockies here as it crosses through the west the next uh, day or so. But here in Alaska, we got another major winter storm that will bear down on south central areas uh, Sunday into the day on Monday. And some of the moisture from this system is going to spread farther north up across the Alaska range to about Fairbanks and areas uh, to, to the uh, east of there to the Alcan border, as well as along portions of the northeastern Gulf into the northern third of the panhandle, especially later Sunday night and into Monday. Now, the current uh, warnings we have in effect for the west side of the state will linger into Sunday before expiring. That's because of a frontal system that moved on into that area more recently. And if that's not enough, we have a, another storm uh, around midweek that could once again affect a broad area of the southern mainland. So it's going to be an active weather pattern. Up in Nome, a blizzard warning is in effect until noon. Sunday 27 degrees there with snow and blowing snow uh, also the blizzard warnings include areas like Teller the west side of the Seward Peninsula and out over St. Lawrence Island uh, and areas of the southwest around Dillingham uh, King Salmon southwestward we have ceilings that are lowering this afternoon uh, and as a result you're going to see snow developing uh, especially there up through the southwest interior and the southwest arm of the Alaska range and then the Kenai Peninsula has now been upgraded to a winter storm warning for late tonight through mid-morning Monday. Uh, Kenai Airport showing the lowering uh, clouds base there, ceilings as we refer to in aviation forecasting, nine above, so plenty of cold air at the surface. Anchorage, Merrill Field, you can see some lower clouds over Cook Inlet, but the clouds, overcast skies, the ceilings will be lowering as well. We're gonna get a little light snow in here probably this Saturday night, but the bulk of the snow coming to Anchorage, not until later Sunday evening, the overnight period into Monday morning. And uh, Anchorage area could once again see uh, 6, 12 inches of snow with locally higher amounts east side of town and up toward the mountains. So another significant snowfall is uh, in the making. So the current warnings and advisories we have, still winter with storm warnings for Ambler, Galena, going down the lower Yukon Valley. As you get out along the southern and western coast of the Seward Peninsula and St. Lawrence Island, a blizzard warning. Uh, remains in effect until noon Sunday. That activity will be winding down as we get into Sunday. It's then as we work our way east, it'll be problematic because low pressure is coming up out of the North Pacific on the south side of the Alaska Peninsula. We'll be crossing Kodiak Island later uh, on Sunday afternoon and then be located up toward the southeast side of Prince William Sound by mid afternoon Monday. With a track like that, we're gonna have uh, snow occurring tonight into uh, Sunday. Uh, areas of the southwest interior, Antioch down through Dillingham, King Salmon, the kind of the southwest arm of the Alaska Range. And then as all of that moves further uh, east uh, with that low, uh, we're including the Anchorage Bowl, the Matsu Valley, and then into the Copper River Basin. And then eventually uh, the moisture there coming along the northern Gulf is going to spread eastward. Yakutat has a winter storm warning in effect for late Sunday night into Monday and a winter storm watch for the northern portion of the Panhandle, uh, including Juneau. Uh, Haynes, Skagway, uh, as a result of that moisture working its way east. And there's plenty of cold air in place for that to stay in the form of snow. So we're seeing an initial enhancement to the cloud cover satellite imagery. That's the leading edge of some warmer air that's going to produce some lighter snows tonight. So you're what we call kind of the, the, the lead snows that come out ahead of a, a system with the warmer air uh, coming in aloft. The main low is still taking shape south of the eastern Aleutians in the North Pacific. That feature will get a little better organized. You can kind of see the clouds there on Alaska to the south and west. That's part of the main system that will eventually take shape. So this afternoon right now, there's a little wave of low pressure south end of uh, an occluded front. We still have a pretty good low up there in the northern bearing. That's what's responsible for the winter storm warnings, blizzard warnings for the western parts of the state. But that feature will begin to loosen its grip on Sunday. But by early 
early uh, Sunday morning, we'll have a low located on the south side of the Alaska Peninsula, heading up to Kodiak Island by tomorrow afternoon, and heavier snow on the north side of that low, spreading across Cook Inlet, the uh, Kenai Peninsula, and some of the mountainous areas, the eastern Kenai, eastern Chugach could pick up two, three feet of snow with this uh, storm system. It's going to be hazardous driving conditions pretty much from uh, old Fairbanks south down through the Alaska Range, and especially as you drive uh, Anchorage Bowl and down through uh, areas of the uh, Seward Peninsula. That travel not recommended here as we get into uh, later Sunday, and especially for Monday, it's going to be uh, tough going. And the system by Monday afternoon will be located on the southeast side of Prince William Sound. Uh, we look to the west, there's another system in the bearing, but there's going to be another low come up out of the North Pacific that could take a track toward Bristol Bay that uh, could impact south central areas again midweek later Wednesday uh, into the day Thursday. Temperatures chilly, 12 below there, Glen Allen uh, still in the teens, lower teens. Sunday afternoon we'll see readings bump up uh, across the southwest, 40 at Kodiak, but again we're going to have snow overspreading Cook Inlet and the Kenai Peninsula throughout the day, heavier snow uh, spreading, overspreading the region, and especially Sunday night and early Monday. Monday morning lows will have come up a bit because typically when you get that kind of snow temperatures do rise and then Monday afternoon temperatures above freezing southern outer panhandle and including places like Seward Homer but staying below freezing say at Anchorage and certainly to the north and west uh, unfortunately I was not able to get any temperature forecast uh, information into the system so I was not able to show you the uh, Yukon River and areas in northern parts of the state but for the southwest Sunday afternoon we'll see some temperatures a bit above freezing Dillingham King Salmon especially 40s there along the Alaska Peninsula and eastern Aleutians but on the back side of the low as north winds pick up we see colder air pouring in through the southwest interior and temperatures Monday afternoon places like Bethel Antioch will be well below freezing back down in in the teens and 20s still holding in the 40s along the Aleutian chain and as we go up through mid-month to December 20th the 16th through the 20th above normal temperatures across much of the mainland centered on the southwest with below normal temperatures expected across the panhandle and with this kind of pattern that would suggest uh, more in the way of precipitation averaging a bit above normal the west side of the state uh, from December 16th through the 20th centered there north of Bethel on up around uh, Norton Sound Nome and Kotzebue with below normal precipitation anticipated there, especially southern half of the Panhandle. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Let's look at your aviation weather. If you have a flight planned Sunday or on Monday, by far the most significant weather feature will be an area of low pressure that develops Saturday night south of the Alaska Peninsula and then tracks northeastward on Sunday up and along. Kodiak Island to Prince William Sound by uh, Monday afternoon and this feature is going to bring another major winter storm uh, to areas of south central Alaska including uh, the Kenai Peninsula, Anchorage Bowl, Lower uh, Susitna Matsu Valley spreading east eastward and eventually uh, some of that snow will spread across the northeastern Gulf into the northern panhandle uh, as we get into uh, Monday uh, late afternoon evening uh, early Tuesday morning. Uh, another area of low pressure out over the northern bearing uh, will track upward along the eastern Russian coast and then kind of pull back along the Arctic Russian coast uh, and then high pressure out over uh, northwest Canada there British Columbia uh, southeast portion of the Yukon will give way to that system that will work its way through the western Gulf but widespread IFR conditions with heavy snow will overspread uh, from the panhandle areas of the western southwestern Alaska range up through Cook Inlet the Kenai Peninsula so that uh, come Sunday afternoon and especially Sunday night areas uh, around Anchorage will be uh, getting heavy snowfall with low ceilings and visibilities and uh, some areas uh, up through say Turnigan Pass could see a couple feet of snow uh, so again a very uh, robust system uh, it'll be continuing to work its way eastward the low up into Prince William Sound as we get into Monday afternoon but as you can see widespread IFR conditions anticipated there along areas of the Gulf uh, up through Cook Inlet uh, the Alaska Range and even up in through the central interior to the south side of the Brooks Range and then Monday afternoon that low pressure 
pressure system and energy will begin to shift eastward by Monday evening and diminish, not be quite as, uh, the snow won't be quite as heavy, but nevertheless will be shifting eastward there into the northeastern Gulf and northern Panhandle for Monday night and early Tuesday morning. And a Tuvik Pass will generally have IFR conditions there southward, MVFR to the north along the north slope. Same thing, Attigan Pass, IFR conditions generally uh, southern half of the pass down uh, and continuing south of there and southwestward. And then for Lake Clark and Merrill with that winter storm uh, overspreading the region Sunday with the heavier snowfall, Lake Clark and Merrill IFR, Rainy Pass IFR, Windy Pass also IFR, though you may encounter MVFR conditions as you fly north of the north entrance in, in that general area, but very poor aviation uh, flying conditions there across south central on Sunday into especially Monday uh, morning and afternoon. Isabel Pass MVFR becoming IFR. Uh, late Sunday into Sunday night and uh, Mentasta Pass should generally see VFR conditions uh, throughout uh, the daylight hours of Sunday but giving way to MVFR toward evening and Tanita Pass uh, will be socked in with IFR conditions as will be uh, Portage Pass because there will be some pretty heavy uh, snowfall there through the Chugach range two three feet of snow could fall in the higher elevations uh, there through areas of the eastern uh, Kenai Peninsula and areas east of Anchorage. Chilkoot and White VFR conditions will hold there as a good chunk there of the panhandle during the day on Sunday. So here ahead of the storm we do have a ridge, a dome of warmer air uh, protruding northward from out of the North Pacific with uh, uh, freezing levels aloft uh, upwards of 2,000 feet there up to the north side of Kodiak Island and rising to 10,000 feet aloft as you get well south of Kodiak Island. As a result the greatest threat for icing will be uh, as we go through Sunday uh, later morning and afternoon will be there through the entrance of Cook Inlet just south of uh, the Kenai Peninsula and down through Shelikoff Strait north side of Kodiak Island generally around and above 4,000 feet was surrounded by a broad area of uh, potential for some considerable moderate icing. Here we have the ridge ahead of the system uh, large ridge of high pressure through the Gulf with uh, anti-cyclonic uh, jet uh, core uh, upwards of 100 135 knots there through the Yukon Valley and into Northwest Canada and then bringing it down to uh, 700 millibars we see winds aloft from the southwest 75 knots there south of Kodiak Island and 3,000 feet we have uh, low pressure circulation Sunday afternoon over Kodiak Island with strong southeast uh, 60 knot uh, flow ahead of that uh, into Prince William Sound and here is what we anticipate for turbulence, broad area of considerable moderate turbulence anticipated across the west, uh, Cook Inlet, uh, Western Gulf, down along the Alaska Peninsula and extending back out through the Aleutian chain. So definitely take heed uh, to the system that is gonna be moving up into South Central Alaska. It'll be a significant storm. When you think of a national park, you probably envision wide open natural spaces undisturbed by human activity. There are indeed such places, but even in some of the most remote areas of a place like Kenai Fjords National Park in Alaska, the mark of man is present. Marine debris is a menace to the farthest reaches of our globe, and even designated national park lands are not immune. In the summer of 2009, the Resurrection Bay Conservation Alliance, a grassroots conservation organization based in Seward, Alaska, decided to do something about the marine debris fouling the beaches of Kenai Fjords National Park. Marine Debris Coordinator Tim Johnson had first-hand experience with the issue. The summer before, uh, my wife and I, Michelle, had done a paddle from Seward, a uh, sea kayak paddle from Seward to Homer. Really, our eyes were open to some areas that we didn't realize there was so much accumulation. It was very deceiving up front. You couldn't really get a feel for the, the extent and impact of it. You've got this, this, this nice high tide line that's quite pristine, and you really don't get a picture for the, the impact, the amount of uh, debris in that area until you get behind those storm berms. You get back into the lagoon and the, the vegetation around those lagoons. And then you see the, the absolute extent back into that veg and how intertwined and enmeshed 
on these decades of trash deposition. So we were just appalled by that and said we could, we got to put some, we got to get something together on a larger scale. The Resurrection Bay Conservation Alliance is a local um, nonprofit community organization, and they have been instrumental in helping um, the Park Service obtain funding to to get uh, a boats, larger boats to help move the debris and they get volunteer labor and organize the work trips. And so it's really a partnership between the Park Service and the community to help get out and really get a project done that in and of itself any one group couldn't do it on their own. Most of that trash was baggable, however, there were large items, huge, you know, piles of hauser line, uh, for example, that, you know, we just had to hoist up onto the boat. The volunteers didn't just bag, haul, and hoist the garbage, but also carefully recorded what types of debris were collected. In many ways, the debris itself is a resource. Um, archaeologists use middens, the trash heaps, um, as a way of analyzing past cultures. And in one sense, marine debris is a form of a midden. It's a trash heap that left for the future would be something that people could use to analyze our cu culture. It may not say the best things about our culture or everything that we want, but we need to be able to document what we've done um, so that we can preserve that legacy, um, make sure that we as a society don't forget what we've, what we've been doing. We had two larger categories of, of, of marine debris that we picked up. Um, commercial fishing um, means like, um, say, uh, gill nets, um, large hauser lines, anything that, that would be associated with more of a commercial fishing scale. And then the second category was, was more recreational fishing and household, you know, which would be you know, general plastics, um, you know, things like that. Um, so we had about a 75% of the commercial fishing uh, marine debris element, and about 25% of the recreational and household further out the bay, and we had the exact opposite the closer we got to Seward uh, within the bay. It was about 25% commercial uh, fishing versus 75% recreational fishing and, and household. The trash is not just unsightly for park visitors, but also poses threats to wildlife and marine habitat. Really one of the larger issues now that you go to this plastic that has, uh, can really get into the food web and affect the food web differently than something like glass. These substances, for instance, all these polystyrene blocks that are breaking down into all these little crumbly bits are, are further breaking down on a microscopic level and uh, how much of an impact that has, you know, in this ecosystem is yet to be determined, but I think it's got pretty high potential. Uh, you know, well known the sea turtles will eat plastic bags floating in the water. They look like jellyfish to a sea turtle, and um, obviously a plastic bag doesn't uh, go well in the digestive system of a turtle. Um, albatross will see small pieces of plastic floating on the surface and think they're small fish and other food sources and eat that in their stomachs, especially in some of the um, northwestern Hawaiian islands, it, they, they'll find that albatross that have starved to death with a full stomach and it's full of pieces of plastic.
We're affecting our local areas this way, uh, but we need to be thinking about it from more of a state and, and, and global international uh, scale. And, and most importantly, to, to try and focus on prevention of it coming in the first place, because we're just going to see this continuing you know, to build up on our beaches unless we're able to, to get a little bit more of an approach on, on prevention on the front end. Marine debris is really a global problem, um, you know, in all the oceans, and you know there are many different sources. Global shipping is one. Fishing debris from commercial fishing, um, recreational boating activity, activity on land, stuff blowing off land, washing down streams, people just throwing stuff on the shore. Though the problem can seem overwhelming, Johnson remains upbeat about making a positive difference. No, you got to you got to start locally. You got to you know take control of what you can do, and 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 make something with that, and and try and you know move on from there. Overall, more than nine tons of debris was removed from the beaches of Kenai Fjords National Park and transported back to Seward to be deposited in a landfill. People gave a lot to the project in order to make it happen. That was um, awesome. One of the most amazing experiences I've ever um, had. Be able to put that that large of a group of volunteers together, dedicated um, volunteers to put that much effort and, and give that much time and pull all these the different agencies together to see it all happen um, was yeah it was it was incredible. It was incredible. Yeah, very fulfilling. Well, we're now into the home stretch of our show. We'll start with the sea ice edge before marine weather, and ice is in place across the far north, especially there through the Arctic coast, but there is some open water in the lower Chukchi Sea down through the Bering Strait. That shall continue, uh, though temperatures will not be as mild as what they uh, were the other week. And down along areas of uh, Norton Sound through the southwest coast, including the YK Delta's ice there, uh, could shift a bit as winds, uh, as we get, especially toward midweek, we're going to see first uh, winds that may be a bit offshore once low takes up into the western portion of the Gulf, but then uh, another system will be working its way toward uh, Bristol Bay as we get into Tuesday. In the meantime, Sunday, winds will be out of the north there across the inner channels of the Panhandle, 30 knots, Petersburg on up through Lynn Canal with six foot waves, 15 knots out of the north, three foot waves, catch a can, Matlakatla. Outer Gulf Coast, south of Sitka, 10 to 15 knot north winds, seven to eight foot waves, and then southeast winds picking up west of Yakutat to 35 knots there into south of Cordova, waves six to eight feet in the northern Gulf. And then for Monday, southeast winds, inner channels, 15 to 20 knots. We're gonna have areas of snow pushing through, waves three to four feet, but the outer coast, much stronger winds, 35 to 45 knots southeasterly gales, waves uh, 14 to 18 feet Sitka south, but once you get uh, Gustavus west and northwestward waves could be 20 plus feet and then on Sunday across the Gulf with the approaching low coming out of Kodiak Island winds will be easterly 25 knots Prince William Sound wave six feet 35 knot uh, easterly gales uh, off the Kenai and then uh, the entrance of Cook Inlet 40 to 45 knot easterly gales with waves uh, 10 to 12 feet on Monday, uh, low pressure will then be situated just on the southeast side of Prince William Sound and winds off the Kenai uh, will be out of the northwest, 35 knots, waves 15 feet, uh, as high as 45 to 50 knot uh, gale to storm force winds at the entrance of Cook Inlet with waves running 15 to 16 feet and lighter winds further north up toward Anchorage, north end of the, uh, the inlet. We're looking at north winds 15 knots, waves a few feet. Across Kodiak Island, uh, Shelikov Strait, northeast winds 30 knots. So the low is going to be crossing Kodiak Island Sunday afternoon. And ahead of it, winds south, southwest 30 knots. But on the North Pacific side, I should say on the Bering side, winds turn north, northwest 25 to 30 knots with waves of 6 to 9 feet. 
Monday, in the wake of the low that's sitting up in the northwestern Gulf, uh, west winds 35 knots, Shelikov Strait, 10-foot waves, 40 knot, northwesterly gales, uh, especially south and southwest of Kodiak Island, waves 15 feet, but winds will try to turn back toward the south north of Cold Bay with 10-foot waves there on the Bering side. And across the central eastern Aleutians, look for northwest to west winds 25 to 30 knots, waves running generally around 10 feet on both the North Pacific and uh, Bering side of the island chain and then for Monday winds are going to pick up again uh, west southwest 35 to 49 gales across uh, the length of the Aleutians waves could build upwards of 18 to 20 feet on the North Pacific side and generally 12 to 14 feet on the Bering side uh, away from shelter of the islands out across the central eastern open waters of the Bering winds will be out of the west 25 to 30 knots waves upwards of 12 to 16 feet St. Matthew St. Paul look for a west wind 25 knots into Norton Sound with ice in place and then on Monday, we expect winds to be with low pressure approaching St. Paul there from the west. Winds south turning back toward the east at 35 to 40 knot uh, strength with waves running 8 to 10 feet. Look for south winds in Norton Sound, 25 knots with the ice there remaining in place. And then along the Gulf Coast, I should say the uh, Arctic Coast, uh, winds are going to be 25 to 30 knots from the east, Utgiadvik through Kaktovik with ice in place. But they increase uh, to 35 knots from the southeast across the lower Chukchi Sea with a mix of ice and some open water toward the Bering Strait and then winds turn westerly north side of St. Lawrence Island with waves as high as 14 feet there off of uh, Port Clarence and then finally Monday we are missing some of the ice data but nevertheless we expect winds generally out of the east there across the Arctic coast 15 to 25 knots with ice in place but they're going to turn more around to the south southwest through the lower Chukchi Sea and down through the Bering Strait accelerating upwards of 25 to 30 knots with even 35 knots there uh, in the lower Chukchi Sea on the north side of the Bering Strait and where there is open water waves could run anywhere from five to as high as nine feet. So that wraps up the uh, weather show for this Saturday evening. Thank you for joining me and be sure to uh, check in again tomorrow with the latest update on the major winter storm. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.